You know, today's lesson uh, is going to be our preparation for our communion. We'll have our, our lesson, we'll have a song, and uh, then we'll have a chance to uh, break bread and uh, celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The lesson today is entitled, Tears in Babylon and Zion. Let's turn to Psalm 137. This psalm, this song, was written shortly after the Lord used Nebuchadnezzar to take Judah into exile into Babylon. So the date is shortly after, about 606 B.C. Now, a lot of folks believe that the height of Israel's glory was about 1,000 B.C. during the kingship of David, and that's certainly true. But not known to everybody, right before the time of exile, there was another great king named King Josiah that was able to usher in an incredible time of restoring the scriptures back into Judah. And incredible miracles were seen by all the brothers and sisters. Well, shortly after that, there was a series of kings that led them the wrong direction. And then the Lord disciplined Judah and sent them into exile in the Babylon. And so we read this song, this psalm, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, May my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Now right here, you just feel the pain. You feel the brokenheartedness of the Jews that have been swept in to Babylon. Even the people that swept them on in, and I think they were trying to cheer the Jewish people up and say, Hey, sing us a song! They said, hey, we've hung up our harps. <laughs> we can't sing anymore. There's no joy in our hearts. See, these were tears of leaving. I understand those tears. I can understand this song. In 2003, Elaine and I packed up pretty much everything we had, just one little truck, and drove out of Los Angeles literally in tears. As we traveled up the five to Portland, every place that we went by held a memory. Oh, we studied with that guy there. Ah, oh, that's where that woman was baptized. Oh, that's where we started that ministry. And as we drove out, we just, in tears, remembered what used to be. It's just like the guys here. It says, we sat by the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept and we couldn't sing anymore. So, well, how did, you, how did you get to that place? Well, back in 1972, April 11th, I was baptized into Christ as a disciple. That's, that's right about where the dinosaurs went extinct. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And, uh, I mean, I was 17 years old. I was fired up. I'd come from a denominational background. And even though I kind of fought a little bit God's plan of salvation, when I saw it in the scriptures, I said, that is right. You've got to have faith. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized. And that's the only way to be saved. And I was so fired up that I found the Lord and found the truth. Amen, guys? And, and it was awesome because in that day, the Lord had me baptized into a, a mainline church of Christ that had a very dynamic campus ministry. So the college students were in the terminology of that day, totally committed. Where the singles and the marrieds, they were, they were pretty lukewarm, pretty out there. I mean, afterwards, sometimes you'd see some of the deacons smoking out front. That, that's the level we're talking about. And, uh, and, and so, into this situation, Elaine and I were baptized, and it was called the Crossroads Church of Christ. And many of us that were baptized, we became so grateful to the Lord. We said, hey, we've got to take this to some other campuses. 
And so we really believe the Holy Spirit sent us to different campuses around the United States, and we started different campus ministries in what became known as the Crossroads Movement, or the other name for that movement was the Total Commitment Movement. And uh, we, we, we'd baptize, we'd get on the college campuses, we'd preach the word, and more and more young people would come. But then after a while, there'd be a, a lot of challenges inside the church. Because as Jesus said, when you pour new wine into old wineskin, you ruin both the wineskin and the wine. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it was, it was shaking up these churches. Some of these churches went through splits and divisions. And a lot of the ministers, and even some of the young people that were baptized in Christ, they left the Lord because they, they looked at the older people and said, how can this be God's church? And so they left. And both the wineskin and the wine were ruined. Well, we were in several campus ministries in the 70s. And then in 1979, we got an opportunity to go to Boston, Massachusetts. And it was a, a unique opportunity because when the elders there talked to me about coming, they said, Kip, you know, we've got some, some, some good news but some bad news. Right now we only have enough money for one paid minister because the church had shrunk to about 60 people. They'd only had two baptisms in the previous three years. And I guess you've got to get about that desperate to hire me and Elena, you know what I'm talking about. Right. So, well, the bad news is we only have one salary. But the good news would be that you'd be the campus minister and the preacher. I go, amen. You know, I was 25 years old. I thought I knew pretty much everything by that time. And uh, I, I was excited because then, then I had this vision that not only would the college students be called to be totally committed, but that we would call the singles to be totally committed, even the married people totally committed. And even people as old as Jeff totally committed. And the teens totally committed. And that was the vision. Well, what happened was we met our first night. It was in the Gimple's living room, what we call the 30 would-be disciples. And we had an incredible time of prayer and fellowship. And we dreamed the dream of a church where every single person was totally committed. Well, I, I, it was amazing. The first year, we saw 103 people baptized into Christ. What a lot of people don't know is the actual membership was about 60, but only 30 of the people showed up. In that year, about 30 people walked away because they didn't want it. You know, they were attending church, but once total commitment was laid out, they didn't want it. But you know something? People didn't notice because when you have 30 people leave, but 103, Three people that are fired up in the Lord, added by the Holy Spirit. You go, wow, something is credible is happening right there. The second year, 200 people were baptized. The third year, 250 people were baptized. I mean, we knew that the Lord was working in an, in an extraordinary way. And we started thinking, says, well, you know, really, there's nothing special about Boston per se. You know, really, you could, you could have a small group of disciples in any city. And if they were all totally committed, they would make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And literally that whole city could be filled with the message of Jesus Christ, just like Jerusalem was in Acts chapter 5. And then we thought, well, you know, if disciples make disciples and one church can plant another church, then couldn't you go to the major cities of the world and plant a church of only totally committed disciples who then would preach the word and they would plant churches in surrounding capitals of the nations and then those churches would plant churches in the smaller cities and villages you could evangelize the entire world in a generation and that became the vision of what became known as the boston movement see when we went to boston and we started the work there we were known as one of the crossroads campus ministries but the uniqueness was we called everybody to be totally committed and so through the 80s, we preached this message. Even to the point where some of the old campus ministry churches, they turned to bosses and said, hey, we want to be like you. We want everybody to be totally committed. And so we would call everybody to be totally committed. And we reconstructed. Yeah, tons of people left, but far more were baptized into Jesus Christ. And incredible things happened. Our first church planted was Chicago, and then London, and then New York. And then Johannesburg, then Paris, then Stockholm, then Bombay. I mean, the Lord was on the move. Amen? Well, we felt that in 1990, we were needed in Los Angeles. And the church was planted here in 1989 in the summer with about 50 disciples, some from Boston, some from San Francisco, and some from San Diego. 
But by January 1, 1990, Elaine and I came, and then we got to see the hand of God in an incredible way. From 1990 to 2000, the church grew from 154 to 10,000 disciples. I mean, incredible. the most incredible moment, in my opinion, was when we got to meet in the Rose Bowl. And there were 17,000 people there. That was the dream of the church, was to meet in the Rose Bowl. And then we said, we're going to go back. And the next time, we'd fill it. Well, the Lord blessed us in incredible ways. And by the year 2000, the multiplication of disciples had been so prolific that the one church in Boston that started with the 30 would-be disciples in one nation, the U.S., had multiplied into 171 nations, 400 churches, with a Sunday attendance of 200,000. Wow, that's God. Some of the churches literally were having thousands of baptisms every year. I mean, we, Elaine and I were blessed to be able to plant the Moscow church. In the first year of the Moscow church, we took 17 disciples and we saw 850 baptized in Christ. I mean, it was obvious. It was God. We celebrated incredibly. The, the, the whole kingdom did in the year 2000. And I think we all know that, that when the Lord does great things, Satan's right there trying to destroy it. And it's interesting right here in this psalm in verse 7. It says, remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its uh, foundations. Wow, there, there are people out there that wanted to tear down the work of God. In the next few months, some of the most dramatic events in Elena's my life would take place. Early on in 2001, one of our children began to, to suffer some depression issues and began to doubt their commitment to Christ. And what happened in that time is a lot of people then around us began to doubt whether or not we were worthy leaders because people thought, well, if your kid is struggling, well, what wicked sin have you done? And so by the fall of 2001, there was a strong feeling that we needed to step aside and take a sabbatical. Well, during the next year, a group of leaders rose up in our fellowship, the kingdom teachers, as we called them, and as well as the, the kingdom elders. And all of these men came from a mainline Church of Christ persuasion. And in looking at what we had done, and certainly our ministry was filled with many sins and many mistakes, um, they began to lay the foundation for taking our churches back to a more mainline theology. By November 2002, all the world sector leaders and Elena and myself were asked to step down. The central leadership of what became known as the ICOC, which was simply the Boston Movement, was dismantled. At that time, autonomy was placed as government in our churches. All overseeing evangelists were done away with. All structure, for the most part, was done away with, thinking it wasn't biblical. You know, where do you find in the Bible a discipleship partner? Where do you find in the Bible a Bible? Where do you find in the Bible a youth minister? Where do you find a lead evangelist? And, of course, this came from a mainline Church of Christ theology that says, you know, you've got to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible's silent. In other words, in the Church of Christ, the mainline church, they said, hold it. There's got to be a command or there's got to be a pattern in order for you to do something. Now, in our fellowship, in my persuasion always, was that was the case. I always believed, hey, you speak where the Bible is silent, and you're silent where the Bible speaks. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if the Bible says something, you've got to flat do it. If it doesn't say anything against it, go ahead and have a good time. Amen? Anything that promotes the gospel. Well, by 2003, the Crete letter came, and it was the match that I believe Satan used, and God used, to refine our whole fellowship. Come on, Jerry. In April, Elaine and I went to the present leaders of the L.A. church. We said, listen, we totally disagree the direction this thing is going. People need to know what's happening worldwide. And he says, no, we're going in a different direction. I said, well, what are you saying? They said, well, Kip, maybe you just need to step down, leave the ministry. That was the toughest, toughest time in our life. At that point, I didn't know where we were going. And, of course, a couple months later, 
there was a friend that called and says, hey, can you help out the Portland church? And maybe the Portland church felt a little sorry for us, so they invited us to preach there. But it was the toughest time. Remembering Zion. Remembering the great things that, that God had done. And then, of course, going to Portland. Well, Portland had been so devastated. I remember our first midweek service there. Uh, the brother I love a lot. I kind of tease him that he's an older guy. His name is Guy. And, but he's six months older than myself. And uh, we were there early for midweek. And I said, well, Guy, how many chairs should we set up? 20 or 25? He kind of thought about it. He says, brother, you need to have faith. Let's set up 25. I go, okay, we'll set up 25. <laughs> And that's how many we had. Well, we set up 80 this morning. Was that awesome? So we had to set up some extra ones here in the back and everything. But from there, the Holy Spirit began to work. Three years later, I mean, the church now is having over 500 on Sunday. Last year, we saw over 100 people baptized into Christ. I mean, God is working in a great way. What's exciting is now there are other churches that are saying, hold it. We want to be sold out disciples. That kind of echoes back to the 70s, doesn't it? Totally committed, sold out. And so many new churches have been started over the last several months. And excitingly, just this past week, there's now a new church in Bombay, or they would say Mumbai, India, of a group of disciples that says, listen, we want to be sold out disciples and be a part of the Portland discipling movement. Is that exciting? God is moving in a great way. Now, in the midst of all of that pain, in the midst of the heartbreak of seeing your dreams and what you've done, there was a lot I had to learn. See, I believe with all of my heart that God is sovereign. That means that everything that happens, everything that happens to you, God either makes happen or he allows it to happen. Let's go check out Hebrews chapter 12. This was a passage I preached, but never understood. You ever read a passage like that? You read it over, you taught other people, but you never understood it. Here's what God says in Hebrews 12, verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. Wow. Hardship. Well, that, that's tough times, tough financial times. Losing your job, people abandoning you, those are hardships, would you not agree? See, when I got to Portland, one thing that, that the church there taught me is that when you do lousy spiritually, particularly when you get bitter in your heart or angry, you become very man-focused. And we have a tendency to blame other people for what's going on in our lives. And yes, people sin against us. You know why? They're sinners. And boy, aren't we good at identifying all the ways and hurts that people have sinned against us. When, when we sin against someone, oh, sorry, bro. <laughs> and right here, the Bible says in verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Wow. That means you go through a hard time. It's just the Lord working on you. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children, not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Can I have an amen on that one? Yeah. But painful. Painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live at peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Right here, the Lord lays it out. He says, everything that happens to you, either I... Make it happen, or I allow it to happen. That means, as we start saying in Portland, bitterness is understandable, but totally unacceptable. Because God's in control. And there's something 
You're supposed to get out of this pain. And so the second thing, as I learned, is you don't waste your pain. Don't waste your pain. You see, hardship is caused or allowed by God so that we will either be disciplined and become better sons and daughters, but unfortunately, many of us who go through hard times become bitter sons or daughters. What's hardship done for you? Have you become a better disciple or a bitter disciple? You know, in the midst of understanding these concepts, one of the things that I need to do, just personally, to help me get back with the Lord, was I had to separate God and the movement. You see, when, when the movement began to die, when it began to crumble, I mean, my faith began to crumble because God and the movement were one in my mind. And so when it went, I started going down spiritually. But when I was able to separate, I go, hey, God is as awesome as I ever thought he was more awesome. The movement, well, it's filled with people like me and you. <laughs> and every now and then we tank, don't we? <laughs> I go, wow, separate that up. Second thing I had to do, I had jumbled up being a disciple of being a leader. I'd melded them together. That was my identity. I had to separate them on out. And I remembered, hey, when I was 17, I didn't even think about leadership. I was just fired up to be saved. I was fired up to know God. I was fired up to have a purpose. It was, it was awesome. But when I tied into the leadership, and if some people didn't want me leading, then, oh, then, then I, oh man, I wasn't all that fired up about being a disciple. But you know something? God wanted me to be his son. And I got fired up. And, of course, we all understand that maturity is learning to be a teacher, is learning to be a leader. That just naturally comes with those that are disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? Thirdly, the Lord had to make me very weak. And I believe one of the great sins in my leadership personally was not taking care of the weak. And when you have challenges come to your children who you greatly love and you see them become weak. And then you yourself become weak. And in this weakness, people are being condemning and down on you. Whoa, it's like hit after hit after hit. And when you become weak, you're wanting some mercy. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm going, man, if I ever get to be strong again, I'm going to be a merciful guy. <laughs> You see how God teaches you like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it was painful. I had to strengthen my, my, my feeble knees and ankles, but it was the way that God had to teach me. See, hey, kid, that's what it feels like to be weak. And when you're weak, you want a little mercy. So, by grace, if I allow you to become strong, remember the weak and be merciful. And be merciful. You know, it's exciting to, to be able to grow as a Christian. You know, I'm 52 years old right now. And uh, I don't know if the Lord's going to promise me to the end of the day. But I'm hoping he gives me a bunch more years. So I can put into practice all of these things. That God, sovereignty, the hardship and the pain were necessary for me to grow in as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah, when we drove out of L.A., 2003, tears, because the memories hurt so, so much. But then, just a couple days ago, we drove back in. Let's go to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. I love just even the first verse of this. Remember, a psalm is a song sung with stringed instruments. And so they would sing. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men 
who dreamed. Let's just stop right there. Can you imagine being swept away into captivity, being in Jerusalem, seeing all the miracles of God, and now being swept into a foreign land, swept into Babylon? I mean, they felt so depressed, so heartbroken, so much pain, they hung up their harps. They couldn't sing. And you know something, when you're happy, you sing, don't you? Maybe it's in the shower, but in the shower you crank, don't you? You're happy. You're happy. I mean, it was, it was, it was incredible. It, it was amazing. We were just, you know, we're coming on in. And one of my favorite groups, and this will date me a bit, is the Beach Boys. So I later wanted to play one particular CD. I go, well, you know, babe, those are awesome. But we need to be listening to the Beach Boys going on in here. <laughs> and, you know, we're crossing the line right here, and the Beach Boys are blurting out, you know, good vibrations. By the way, the Beach Boys are from Hawthorne. Amen. And, uh, I mean, it, and, and it was great. But you know something? You know, you know what happened is that then I, I started having tears of returning. And then what was, there was no pain. It was just, I'm back. God, in your grace, you've given me a second chance. And the Beach Boys sound great. Amen. <laughs> And, and look, see if you can relate to these guys as they, as they sing this song. Now, you've got to understand, Jerusalem is located about a mile up in the mountains. It's, it's incredible if you've ever been over there. And so the 120s in the Psalms are called the Psalms or the Songs of Ascent. They would be the, the, the songs that the Jews would be singing as they came back from Babylon and as they went up the mountain to Jerusalem, to Zion. To rebuild the temple. To rebuild the wall. And so they would sing on their way up. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men and women who dreamed. Amen. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Yeah, we, we had tears of leaving, and we had tears of returning. Isn't it interesting right here as they're talking about being men and women who dreamed? And, you know, people that don't have a dream really don't have anything to live for. And if you have nothing to live for, you have nothing to die for. There's no passion in your life. And right here, isn't it interesting, in, in the midst of the song, in verse 4, it says, it becomes a prayer, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Now, the Negev is a very dry and deserty area. And so in order for it to blossom, and of course, Israel's in a very uh, similar climate, actually, to Los Angeles, in a very dry and arid area, in order for things to blossom, there's got to be water. And so the prayer came, restore our fortunes, bring the rain so the streams can come and there can be water that brings life. And look at where the source of the water was at. And he tells a little story. Those who sow in tears, the water, will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with it. It was just kind of a picture. Back in those days, of course, they didn't have any tractors. And the way they would plant their fields was very simple. There'd be a pouch of seeds on one hip and a, a pouch of seeds on the other hip. And the farmer would go out and he'd dip his hand in the seed bag, scatter it. He'd walk a little bit further, dip his hand in the other seed bag, scatter it. Dip his hand in, and so on. And the picture right here is of the farmer that loved his land so much that as the seed fell on the soil, the water was his tears that fell on the seed and fell on the soil. And the streams of the Negev, so many tears, returned God's good favor. 
I think there are three challenges for us that I believe are, are timeless challenges, but certainly at this moment in time, we need to consider as God's people. Number one, we need tears for the cross. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 18, Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's just stop right there. The message that I bring, the message that the City of Angels International Christian Church will proclaim is the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, I know some of us come from diverse religious backgrounds, but others come from the old L.A. church. And I consider those people my spiritual children. And I wish no ill upon them. But I've seen different groups at different times and different places, and they become groups that are against something. Whenever you're against something or against someone, negative forces can draw you together for a time. But they will never sustain you. We need to be a church that preaches the positive message of the cross of Jesus Christ and the salvation of all men. Are you with me right here? And we need to have a sweet spirit to all. There will be some people that will oppose us. Some will even call us names. Some will dismiss our efforts. But we need to be a people that preach the cross of Jesus Christ. This is our message. Amen? Look at what he says. This is huge. Look at verse 19. He says, For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligent of the intelligence I will frustrate. You know, we've got to figure out who we are. If we're going to preach the cross of Jesus... Who are we? Well, the Bible says to begin with, he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. We'll read on. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. That's us, guys. We're the foolish people. Jews demand a miraculous signs, Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, that the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it's written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And the church said, See, we've got to figure out who we are first. Those that are saved, right here Paul says, well, hey, where's the wise man? Where's the scholar? Where's the philosopher of this age? Not any of us. <laughs> he goes on and he says, uh, not many of you were wise by human standards. You know, not, not a whole lot of PhDs sitting in the audience. There's, there's not even a lot of master's degrees out there. Know what I'm talking about? He says, not many were influential. I mean, you can only do so much at Subway. You know what I'm talking about? He says, not many were of noble birth. Look at this, guys. But God chose the foolish things of this world. That's you and me. We're foolish things. To shame the wise. God chose the weak things... To shame the strong. He chose the lowly things and the despised things. Tag on. Are you saying we're foolish? We're not influential? We're weak? And we're despised? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 
See, when you, when you understand that, you go, I need the Lord. <laughs> I need the Lord really bad. <laughs> and see, that's where we got off track. That's where we got off track. You know, and taking a step back and looking at all the devastation of what happened, that what was God's movement. Our roots in the 1800s, and some that are scholars in, in church history know, our roots in 1800 with the mainline church of Christ. The 1800s wasn't called the age of enlightenment. And so knowledge was valued. Our roots in the Christian connection, the church of Christ, they valued knowledge. What began to happen is they began, in my opinion, to worship the Bible. Now, we need the Bible. It is our guide, and it is what we go by. But there was a worship of the knowledge of the Bible. Say, if you know everything in here... Then you're really mature. Then the ICOC comes. That's a lot of us. And what we do is what I shared a little bit earlier. We began to worship the movement. And see, God just isn't big on him, anything being worshipped but Him. See, God loves His righteousness more than His movement. And so... As we are starting this new movement now, as God's Spirit is initiating a movement that literally is in many countries already, we need to learn from our sins and our mistakes and say, yes, we need the Word of God. It's not our God, it's our guide. We need a movement, not autonomous churches. It is a movement that swept the world in the first century. Where Paul writes in Colossians 1.23 that every creature under heaven has heard in one generation. But we don't worship the movement or worship those who lead. Because you see, eventually we'll figure out that our leaders are not perfect and our movement's not perfect. And if our faith is in that, then we'll be crushed and destroyed. And so it is by grace that I think we have this chance. But we need to preach the cross and worship Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? And the tears of the cross are not just after you've done the sin study. You go, okay, now we need to do the cross study. And, and the person cries if they're really broken. But God says, I don't desire sacrifice. I desire a broken and contrite heart. When was the last time you cried tears over the cross? That's what it takes to draw close to God. Secondly, we need to cry the tears of discipleship. I know you know the scriptures in Mark 10, verse 17. This young man comes up to Jesus. He's all fired up. And he says, what must I do to be saved, good teacher? And Jesus lists off a bunch of commandments. And he says, listen, I've kept all these since I was a boy. And the Bible simply says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he says, well, one thing you lack. Now, you've got to admit, if you're talking to Jesus and you only lack one thing and then you're going to be saved, you're going, oh, man, this is awesome. Just one more thing and I'm in. <laughs> and then Jesus laid on him. He says, go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. The Bible says the man's face fell and he went away sad. He cried. See, the second thing that we need to have are tears of discipleship. Tears of discipleship. Now, recently, there was a, a new congregation that formed in Las Vegas. They really needed something there in Sin City. Amen, guys? <laughs> and I really appreciate Dan and Denise Triana. Dan was baptized at Cal State Fulton. He was a wrestler there. He was in the ministry in San Diego, and as well as in Las Vegas, he was the original campus minister there. And they said, listen, we need a church of just sold-out disciples. And a lot of people have kind of stumbled over this terminology, sold out disciple. And so it's kind of interesting. They're at the first service, and it was incredible, guys. We had 70 people at our first service. It was, it was awesome. That's how hungry people are to really see the Spirit of God again. And I had these two young ladies come up to me and say, Skip, you know, service today was incredible. It refreshed my soul, but why? Where, where in the Bible is sold out disciple? I says, well, okay. You got your Bibles with you? Oh, yep, got our Bibles. Okay, well, let's turn over to Luke chapter 14. So we turned over. I said, okay, how about you read 
in Luke 14, verse 33. So the one young lady read, In the same way, any of you who doesn't give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. I said, okay, now hold that thought. Okay, and I turned to the other young lady and I said, okay, how about you read Matthew 13? So we went over to Matthew 13. I'd like for you to read verses 44 through 46. And so she read, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid again. And then his joy went and sold all that he had and brought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for five pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and brought it. I turned to both of them. I said, okay, here's two scriptures. What does Jesus teach? And almost word for word, they said that everybody has to be a sold out disciple. I said, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You see, it's very interesting. Back in 1979, when we came to Boston, we were part of the total commitment movement. And we in a good way, called ourselves Christians. But, you know, there's so many different groups out there. You know what I'm talking about? And you go out there, you ask ten people what Christian means, and they'll give you ten different answers. And so that's when I started looking at the Scriptures, and we, we came up with what we now call the discipleship study. Because now the Scriptures qualified what had become kind of a, a fuzzy concept, being a Christian. Now we define disciple. And everybody goes, ooh, hey. We know what that is. Well, what's happened, particularly in the ICOC Fellowship, is now the word disciples become so fuzzy. They're a disciple, he's a disciple, it's a disciple, curtains are a disciple. I mean, you know, everybody's a disciple. <laughs> and it's become fuzzy, and we need to bring some clarity to it. I said, so, okay, we've got to be sold out disciples. You say, isn't that redundant? Yeah, totally. <laughs> you got to be sold out to be a disciple. See what I'm saying right there? But it brings clarity. Isn't it interesting those that stumble over the clarity? Isn't it interesting? You know, one of the things that I've always believed in is that if you're going to do great things for God, you've got to have a church where every single member is if you're in 1979, a totally committed Christian. If you're in 1990, you got to be a disciple. If you're 2007, you got to be a sold out disciple. <laughs> and that is the foundation of the church. Because if you allow lukewarmness into the church, it'll paralyze those that want to do something. And it's often the lukewarm that are the loudest voices. Because they're the ones most resistant to change. And so here, in the new congregation, the, the City of Angels, International Christian Church, we, we want to make sure that we're distinct. So we didn't want any confusion with L.A. We go, okay, we're City of Angels. We certainly want to show that we're kindred spirits and we kept the word international. We're cranking around the world. And we're the Christian church. That is our scriptural persuasion. But I think some of the things that, you know, I, I just want to lay out as, as the evangelist of the church here Come on, kid. Come on, kid. is that as a servant of God, yeah. it is my duty to preach the word and lay it out what it says. Now, you need to always have your Bible when you come to church and take notes. Not because things are interesting, because you'll find that some of the sermons may not be that interesting. But bottom line, you're here to check out what the speaker says. If I'm just stating my opinion, and you don't see it in the Word of God, then blow it off. But if what I'm preaching is from the Word of God, that's not Kip's teaching, that's not Portland's teaching, that is God speaking. And when God speaks, we better listen. And so here in the congregation, here's, here's the bottom line. In order to come into this part of God's church universal, you have to be baptized into Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus tells us to baptize disciples. This is what Jesus did with his disciples in John 4, verses 1 and 2. And so in order to be added to this part of the kingdom, you have to have faith. You've got to repent of all your sins. 
And you've got to be baptized. You've got to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as a disciple. That's what it takes. Now, there are a lot of people, and it's, it's really neat in all of our church. We've got about uh, 13 or 14 churches in the United States right now. We've got about eight or nine churches around the world in different nations right now. And there are a lot of people that want to come. And so I'm a disciple. I'm a disciple. I said, hold on. We've got to be a sold-out disciple. Remember that? And so what's happened is a lot of people in this day of age where everybody does what they think is the right thing. I mean, they go, well, I don't want to come to Wednesday night. That's legalistic. No, 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 no. That's commitment. You know, that'd be like saying, well, I, you know, do I have to just stick with one woman? That's legalistic. No, it isn't. That's commitment. I mean, people go crazy. Next week, we're going to talk about daily Christianity. We're going to lay it out. What does it take to really be a sold-out disciple? But here in, in the church here, we're unapologetic. We expect the members to be here on Sunday morning for church, not because they got it, because they want it. It's going to be fun. And besides that, you'll probably learn a few Spanish words. Amen? We're going to be in midweek. It's going to be a blast. We're going to be in Bible talks because Jesus always worked in small groups. Because there's the power in the small groups. Number one, you don't chicken out. But number two, people can see love. If you're just by yourself, they can't see all the love. You know what I mean? They need to see a group of people that really love each other and really love the Lord. We expect every single member to participate. We expect every member to joyfully be in discipling relationships. I think in the past we developed a culture of silence where the people couldn't speak to the leader or something like that. That was, that was sin. That was a bad mistake. Hey, you got something to say, please say it to me or Elena. Uh, anybody can disciple anybody in this church. Okay? If, you, if there's something that you feel like we do inappropriately here, me or one of the other leaders, as long as you say it respectfully, I'm sure that we'll try our very, very best to listen to it. But here's the bottom line, guys. We all need discipling. You say, are, are you telling me that you at 52 need discipling? Absolutely. I've never been 52 ever in my life. <laughs> I've never been married 30 years before in my life. I've never had three grown-up kids. I've never had the financial strain I've had in my life. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing, guys. All of us are at a point in our life we've never been before. So don't be a know-it-all about your life. You need some help. That's called discipling. We all got to want it. We all got to have it. We got to be unapologetic about that. And we need to do it with love and mercy this time around. Right, guys? <laughs> love and mercy. Because we want it. Amen? So we're unapologetic of what it takes. You know, one of the sad things that was sacrificed and destroyed the movement in the past was no longer a dream to evangelize the world in a generation. This is what this church is all about. Like the early church in Jerusalem, they filled up their city. Like the early church in Jerusalem, they had a vision to take the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so our third point is simply we've got to have tears for world evangelism. Isn't it interesting? Don't you love that story of the Samaritan woman in John 4? She comes to Jesus. They're at the well. Jesus talks about living water. And he says, hey, uh, you know, I'll tell you some more about it, but uh, go get your husband. She goes, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You've had five husbands. The guy you're living with right now is not your husband. She goes, wow, I guess you're a prophet. <laughs> wow, that's the Lord. And then the amazing thing, she goes back to her little town there in Sychar, and she goes, you got to come meet the Christ, the guy that, that told me everything I ever did. They came on out. The whole town was evangelized by one fired-up lady. And the Scripture says in John 4 and 42, it says, Now we know for ourselves that Jesus is the Savior of the world. We know that Jesus died for all sinners. But... If you believe he died for all sinners, wouldn't it be silly if God didn't have a plan to get to all sinners? So he dies for everybody in every country, every player, but we only can have it in a few cities in the United States. That would be dumb. Now, we're the dumb ones, remember? God's not dumb. He's wise. 
If Jesus came as the Savior of the world and he died for the world's sins, don't you think God has a plan to get to all the world? The plan is disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. You know, one of the things that uh, I think is, is exciting is to be able to get the vision back. Turn to uh, Mark chapter 8. There's a story right here that, that, that I've, it's been fascinating to me in Mark 8 and verse 22. This is, this is an unbelievable account. It says, they came to Bethsaida, and some of the people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes. You get a vision right here? Is that your Savior? It's no wonder that Mark remembered that when he says, you know, I remember the time Jesus spit on a guy. You got to ask yourself, when was the last time you spit on someone? He says, when, when he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, she says, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Thank God he didn't spit again. Then his eyes were open and his sight restored. And he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Interesting. First time around, he spits and touches the man. And he sees, but it's fuzzy. Everybody looks like a tree. Now, of course, some of us, we'd probably like to look like trees. Not, not like the bushes. You know what I'm talking about? But, but. He opens his eyes. He goes, man, I, I see the people. They, they look like, like trees. And so Jesus touches him a second time. And he opens his eyes. He says, ah, I see. For me, I know for many in this audience, our sight got fuzzy. We lost our sight of God. We lost our sight of the need of people. We lost the dream. By the mercy of God, he's touched us a second time. And isn't it amazing? He gives us a second shot at this to evangelize the world. That's a merciful God. And just think of all the lessons we've learned. We're better disciples now. Now we know we're nothing. God is giving us a second chance, a new movement with new hope, with the vision to win the entire world for Jesus Christ. You know, I love Los Angeles. Six county area, 20 million lost souls. 700,000 college students, or at least people that go to classes. Right, Angelica? Amen. Over 50% Latin. Amen, Amen Carlos. <laughs> Get this, guys. Every day, every day in Los Angeles, there are 300 young people that come from all across the United States to come to Los Angeles to make it in the business as an actor, an actor, a singer, whatever. 300 people every day with all this hope. And we know so few of them realize it. And those that realize it, their lives stink. So many of them become part of the porno industry. That's also centers here. 400 different ones. A lot of them in San Fernando Valley. That's what happens to a lot of people. You know, amazingly... L.A. has the largest population of Iranians in the U.S. and outside of Iran itself. The same with the Armenians, Bulgarians, Ethiopians, Filipinos, 
Australians, Hungarians, Koreans, Nicaraguans, Vietnamese, there you go, Tim, Sa Salvadorians, Thais, Pacific Islanders, there you go, Manu, and Mexicans. I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> We have the largest population in the U.S. of Japanese, Russians, and Persians. And we have the second largest Jewish population. Oh, yeah. There are 150,000 people involved in gangs, in over 1,000 gangs. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. And yet, each person holds a key to a whole other group of relationships. You know, I'm, I'm excited. This Saturday, I'm inviting all the members of the City of Angels International Christian Church and anybody that wants to come with us to gather at 8 in the morning at the base of Mount Hollywood there, at the observatory, you know. And we're going to climb up Mount Hollywood. And we are going to get a vision for the city. We're going to have a lesson up there, so bring a blanket if you want to sit and then we're going to pray over the city as a church. Because that's why this church is here. Is to be a light on that mountain. You see, we're all about preaching Jesus. That's our message. We're going to preach Jesus from Hollywood to Inglewood. From Santa Monica to San Clemente. From Thousand Oaks to 29 Palms, <laughs> Beverly Hills to Chino Hills, Simi Valley to Apple Valley, Santa Clarita to Santa Anita, Palmdale to Palm Springs, Rancho Palos Verdes to Rancho Cucamonga, from Downey to Upland, Northridge to Southgate, from Big Bear to Little Tokyo, from Laker fans to Clipper fans, we're going to preach Christ and someday fill the Rose Bowl. Thanks and God bless.